If you create e-learning, this episode is for you. Let's talk about VR and e-learning with Hugh Seaton. You are listening to the How to Create VR podcast, weekly conversations with VR professional creators, designers, and producers. Hello and welcome to another episode of the How to Create VR podcast, where I speak with professional creators, designers, developers, and producers who work on VR, AR, and MR projects. I'm your host, Marcella Lewin, founder of HowToCreateVR.com. My guest today is Hugh Seaton. He's the CEO of Aquinas, a VR learning software company that services Fortune 500 organizations in their learning and development. He's also the co-organizer of the NYVR Expo. Today, Hugh and I will be talking all about how to create VR for e-learning and how we can use VR to increase learning retention. Hugh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Marcel. Well, I'm glad to have you here. I think we connected via LinkedIn. I found your website pretty intriguing. Um, being in a production e-learning manager for my day job, I, I thought uh, what you're doing was really cool, and we're going to get into that. Before we get into that, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so I started my career in advertising, believe it or not, in Hong Kong. So I spent a lot of years in greater China creating various kinds of marketing and advertising materials. A couple of years ago, about six years ago, I came back from my latest stint in China. And this thing and that thing got me into learning. I had actually been an adjunct professor anyway. Learning has always been really interesting. And personally, I'm a kind of a diehard, constant learner. And one thing led to another. And I started thinking about how technology can really help with some of the challenges that learning has, which brought me into e-learning and brought me into learning reinforcement. And along the way, I had really fallen in love with, with VR as a, as a way to experience things and, and really thought there was a lot of potential there for learning. And, you know, I, basically 2015 and 16, I spent a lot of time organizing events and doing different things in VR and AR, but didn't think that the industry was quite ready for either of them. And I think towards the end of last year, you started to see some pilots come about that got me excited about it. So all of this is kind of, so in in the meantime, I produced a ton of different kinds of of creative from VR all the way down to, you know, radio. Um, So really have a sense of of what it can do and what it can't vis-a-vis other media. So how did you get into actual VR just from an experience perspective? And what was your first experience with it? So actually, technology and my my love of of technology and technology events is how I got into VR, because some of the people that were doing some of these hackathons I was doing in 2015 and all the way back to 2013, actually, believe it or not, the first hackathon I did was at Facebook and we had an Oculus. Someone had a DK1. This was like right around the time, I think plus or minus two months from when they bought Oculus. I wish I could claim credit, but, you know, not so much. (laughs) So. Along the way, I I, I was able to experience both VR and AR. People in in the architecture space were were playing around with with AR and in some interesting ways as well. So my experiences started off with some of the original, not original, but, you know, some of the the DK1 things. And what really turned a light on for me was uh, and really accelerated my interest in VR as a learning platform is was the Vive. Specifically, something about that moment in Tilt Brush when you change the background. I don't know why. It just had a big impact on me. That and, you know, the hundred other little things that we do. So, yeah, my first experiences were, were in the DK1 and, and were, um, you know, kind of the original ones. For me, the, the turning point really was, was the Vive and, and what the Vive was able to do. That's pretty cool. And you've been doing this for a little while now, which is really neat. A lot of people are just getting into it, including myself. It's interesting to to talk to people that have been doing it for a while. I just finished reading the book Ready Player One. I don't know if you had a chance to read that book yet. It's funny. I um I read and am still such a fan of Snow Crash. And I, I for some reason, I, I don't know why, maybe because I'm just busy running a business now, but I wasn't able to get into uh, Ready Player One as much. I read, I think, the first 20 pages, and it's it's sitting on my bookshelf waiting to be finished. When I found out they're doing a movie, I said, all right, I guess I'm off the hook a little bit. There you go. You can use the movie too. Snow Crash is, uh, I recommend everyone go back to it. It's it's amazing. Snow Crash. All right. We'll check that out for sure. So what's your favorite VR experience as of today? So I'm still a huge fan of Google Earth in VR because it, it really takes you places you could never go. I actually used it to, to trace 
where the Hudson River goes up into Canada, which he just, I mean, forget about doing that any other way. That said, Google has just come out with a light field experiment slash experience that I haven't plugged into yet, but it sounds like that's going to be my new favorite. Yeah, I heard about that. I forgot the name of it. Well, if you Google, if you literally Google, Google, <laughs> Google light field, you'll figure it out. Right, 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 right. Yeah, they just came out of it. I think it was like a week ago. Or, but that's going to be really interesting because really that's the future, right? Light field camera and technology. I think it'll be one of them. I think that, that, you know, as you think about VR and you're so deep into production as well, there isn't a reason to assume that it's always going to be the same thing any more than video is, this, is all one thing. You know, you have really high level film and and high de- high definition movies, and you have stuff people do on their on their iPhone. Yeah, definitely. So tell us about Aquinas, which is your current company. Yeah, we're a um a, so an, a a learning reinforcement and, and learning software company. Our first product actually used mobile to just reinforce lessons from workshops and things like that. And we are are increasingly in, including and involving virtual reality, and soon in time it'll be augmented as well. The point of it being. How do we use small and short experiences? And in the case of VR, how are we giving people that visceral sense of what you get when you're in person in a distributed way? So so to get back to what Aquinas is focused on is very much how are we making the, the learning experience as personal as possible, as ongoing and continuous as possible, as engaging as possible, but also distributing experiences so they're on your phone or, or where you are instead of making people come to a central location. We do that as well, but a lot less. So how do you make them as personal as, as possible, right? Because that's that's the power of VR is once you're in it, you your mind says, I'm, I'm gone from the room I'm in, and now I'm wherever I am. So how, what are some tips or tricks to make it very personal and experiential. Yeah, we know there's a couple of things that VR does differently from other things. One of them is it's okay for the, the other person to be looking you in the eyes, whereas in most video, that's a little weird, unless it's a, you know, a Deadpool movie. So what we, what, the first thing I would say about making it feel personal and, and is especially if you're doing 360, and, and I, I, I I don't. I know some people have an issue with calling that VR, and I'm, I'm unfortunately, I think that's being too nitpicky. I think the the value of being inside a 360 experience is you can see the nonverbals of the person who's talking to you, and that you, it's really it's either impossible or, or prohibitively expensive to do that in a rendered environment. So the way we think of VR is in in kind of two halves. One of them is if in if the learning task or the learning experience really needs you to re- to react to how somebody is 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 the, are themselves reacting, i.e., nonverbals and some of the more nuanced ways people are are displaying themselves to you. You still have to be in 360 right now, which means that interactivity obviously suffers. In the case of of, of thing where there are physical things to be done and skills that involve movement. You, you know, you'll have a rendered environment because you can have full interactivity. Kind of where those two blend is sometimes public speaking. You want to be able to be r- interactive and have the crowd respond. But we're actually okay often with, with that being an avatar that's rendered because a, a lot of things like phobias, you don't need it to be that. You don't need nuance. You, you're, most of the problem is in your own mind and you've kind of created your own narrative. So in terms of personalization, I think it depends on which of the two you're doing. If you're doing 360, it's obviously really difficult to have the content itself be personalized. But because the experience is directly addressed to you, the learner, you feel much more strongly and you react much more strongly than if that the same discussion, the same script were delivered to someone else and you were looking at it in video. A way I, 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 an analogy I use is video is like looking at a conversation through a window and VR is like being at the at the table so you're you're involved with it. In the case of personalizing things that are rendered, there's a lot of ways you can do that that just include in the script you can, you know, a lot of times you you've either got whether it's AI uh, executing the voice or some other things, you can you can look at different ways of personalizing it that are a little more dynamic. That's interesting. And a lot of people are starting to mix 360 live video with let's say like Unity and and adding interactivity so having that blend between just a 360 like you said it's it's live but it's not interactive but they're starting to kind of like add objects to it and have some interactivity are you guys playing with any of that kind of stuff yes yes we are in fact we don't do it in unity we do it in uh, web vr which i think we'll get to in a little bit oh yeah 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 very cool 
Yeah, you can load 360. You can load it as a background and do various things. The difference is you're not interacting with the other people that that you've recorded because a recording is a recording. But you can do things like ch- sort of choose your own adventure or a um, a decision tree where if someone goes one way or, or the other, it can you know load another you know another experience. So I've asked a question and the response might change based on 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 how our our back and forth goes. That's not the smoothest thing in the world, but it it is. It's still pretty. It's it can still be pretty powerful. Well, I want to touch a little bit upon that question and having them answer, which really leads me to like assessments. In in learning, obviously, assessments are really important. Quizzes and any other kind of assessments you want to throw in. How do you bring in assessments into VR e learning, and how is that different from traditional assessments? I I think that you you need to know what VR is probably not the right medium for. So I think semantic knowledge, facts and figures, it's, it's probably not the cleanest way to just find that out. What is it? What I have found um, both in what we've done, but also, you know, I just finished this ebook, VR Learning Primer, and, and I, I actually interviewed a bunch of people, which was really great because some of them have, have gone a little further on the physical skill in, in terms of training physical skills than, than we have. And one in particular a guy named Pinky Gonzalez ran some ran a uh, ran some training at um, at a ITI, which is a crane training company in Oregon. And what they found is that that some of the assessments that you can do in VR are just impossible any any other way. Specifically, how well is somebody in the in the actual job, right? So you can ask them all the questions in the world that doesn't get it whether they're dealing with visual complexity well. Not so silly things like are they afraid of heights? You never know that sitting and watching a video. One of the things that cranes specifically deal with is as the tr- crane itself is moving, you have to deal with the fact that things are, are, you're, are you looking ahead to where it's going? Are you also paying attention to the dials that are in front of you? So there's a spatial reasoning thing or, or aspect that is really impossible to do any other way. So the, the number one thing I think that VR can do that nothing else can do is this idea of spatial reasoning. Beyond that, it's a little bit hard to code in terms of really reading whether someone's doing it or not. But I think we're going to get better and better at how people are interacting, even in soft skills. So where are their eyes looking? Is We can do reasonably well now. Where are the gaze going? We can absolutely do now. Coding gestures is hard because it's it's in 3D and you don't know you know what constitutes a good or a bad gesture, I think, is a problem that, that someone should work out. But broadly, how you deal with physical space, um, I think, isn't really – doable outside of VR. Um, and I think that you can do a lot of that now. And I think as we get smarter about how people interact with simulations, um, it'll, it'll be really an area for, for improvement in the future. So if I understand this correctly, really, the assessment is through the collection of data of how you're reacting to the actual VR experience, right? So instead of literally, let me show you something now, now let me test you on it. By the person doing it, you're collecting data. And that really is part of the assessment. I think absolutely, yeah. Yeah, which makes total sense, right, from an experiential perspective. It also does because unlike any other experience, every pixel that you're experiencing or every, every, the air itself is being rendered by a machine, which means that if you code it, you'll be able to track it. So you don't want a constant flow of, of and record you know, constant flow of a full VR experience. But it does mean that you, if you properly address different things, so you tell the machine to pay attention to you know, whether someone touches this button or not. Every, everything that gets, that gets done is rendered. Everything is mediated through a machine. That includes how, how hard I press, how long, how quickly I, you know, it takes me to go from one dot to another, one button to another. That's, a, that's pretty phenomenal and something I don't think we've explored enough yet. I think that's one of the things we're getting better at. That opens it up for tremendous data collection. Are you guys using like XAPI for collecting all this data? Or how are you collecting data now? And, and more importantly, how are you using that data? Yep. I love that you bring up XAPI. I'm a huge component of it. There's two things to note. XAPI, is not you probably could use it for a full data stream. But the way you need to think about it is first you specify in your, in your VR scene what's important to you. Then the machine is going to start you know, creating a stream of data. Then you want something that is, that is assessing that and then turning it into an event. Because and I say that because XAPI isn't just a way of recording data, it's a way of recording the what data means. Because you're saying, 
Hugh did this well or, or, or didn't do or whatever. So you can have actually rubrics in, included in it. So that's important. We, um, we I, I think XAPI is, is, is required, to be honest, for VR learning. SCORM definitely can't handle anything like the complexity of what, what VR makes possible. We use it for, honestly, it depends a little on what the, the, the customer is looking to do. But certainly establishing baselines, establishing what a rubric even should be, you know, a lot of the things that you're doing in VR, no one has a baseline. They don't know what good really is except kind of qualitatively. So one of the things that, that starts to happen with XAPI and, and data generally is you start to understand what goes into good performance and how do I quantify that? How do I, how do I, how do I establish a cutoff for what, how much eye contact is good and how much isn't good? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm right. Yeah, that could be three zones instead of two. It might not be binary. It might be up to this level is what we want from you. And from here to there is fine. That's a good range. And then beyond that, you're starting to creep someone out. <laughs> well, and then there is data overload, right? You, you capture so much data, but what do you do with it? And it's not just capturing data for the sake of capturing data, right? It's to make sure that you can do something with that later. I think that the learning record stores are getting really good at that. So I've, I've, I've worked with um, Yet Analytics with Watershed and Learning Locker out of the UK. And Yet and, and Watershed, really, I would encourage people who are interested in XAPI to go check their websites out because they publish a lot of how you can use this and how to think about data. They're doing what they should do, which is giving people the knowledge and understanding to, to use their own tool. And then Learning Locker, I've found are also really great. They're publishing a little bit less, but they're actually behind a lot of some of the thinking as well. Well, let's talk about VR micro simulations, which is what you say in your website that you do. What are VR micro simulations compared to like regular simulations like that people create using, let's say, Articulate Storyline or Captivate? That's great. So the um, we, we actually launched this as a first product knowing that that a lot of companies aren't aren't ready for a big VR project. So what we do with micro simulations, it's a very short illustration of what, we, what you've been trained on, specific to new manager training, but, but on it, we can do it for a number of different things. But where we've deployed it right now is with um, clients who are, who, are, who are saying in new manager training, here's how we want you to be coaching in specific areas. So uh, one of them was coaching for success, which means someone who's doing all right, but needs a little encouragement. So we got into actual scenarios. There is actually no interaction with this because these are delivered in a reinforcement kind of use case where someone has been to a workshop, it, there are new managers, so they don't get a lot of intervention and a lot of, of budget spent, which is pretty normal. But we found ways to deliver VR to them wherever they are on their mobile phone, again, using web VR. So it's, it's a, a, a kind of a teaser and a, and a taste for our clients who aren't, aren't really ready for full VR yet, but are, are comfortable trying this out as part of a, a broader service that we provide. We use the word micro because we want to focus people's minds on the fact that you're basically going to see a vignette that's one to two minutes, and it's more about viscerally understanding what we mean when we say, you know, deliver it this way, or how, or what would you do if someone were coming at you in, in a, you know, in different, whether it's a, a, a colleague or, or a, someone that works for you, what would you do if they came at you with a lot of attitude, or they were really angry, or they weren't so angry, but they were curious. So it puts people in a scenario so that as they think about what they learned a month later, or three weeks, or three months later, it brings back what they, what they learned in, in class and really deepens their, their understanding as, as they go through kind of their day-to-day -day work. And these are delivered via 360 video, I'm assuming. They are. In fact, we send, we send mobile notifications that you can just click on because the thing about web VR is it's just a URL. So you can deliver it with a text, with a notification, with an email. So we went that way also because we didn't have to worry about a lot of infrastructure and the, the uh, distribution of it is really simple. You say once they've created it, they can, they can distribute it with a click of a button and then do another one and, and, and distribute it with a, a click of a button. And there are some interactive elements just that are more controls than they are, you know, proper interaction. And they watch this via a mobile device? 
Yeah. So one of what 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 our clients have done is they just send or or, or make available uh, simple cardboard like. Of course, they're a little better than cardboard, but that work like Google Cardboard. So they've got a strap and they've got a nice headset on. But it is it's meant to be sent to your mobile so that you know it's uh, the user experience is is really smooth. Right. So then they can watch it in just a standard three sixty player, or they can put it in like a daydream or something like that. Right. Yeah. Well, it's sent to their phone. So it's, it's, so it's on whatever their phone is, they can just, you know, click on it and it launches. So you touched upon WebVR. Explain, first of all, why did you choose WebVR? And then explain a little bit of the difference between that and Unity and Unreal. So WebVR is, is, is a, it's a way of using web tools to create VR. If you think for a moment about what VR is, it is using a screen, so it's got a display, and that gets split in half, and then each side is different. I, I don't mean to be too pedantic here, but the point is all you're doing is putting something on a screen. So there's no reason a web page can't do that. And you know, however many years ago, a guy named Brendan Jones realized that and created a web VR a- a- API, that on, on, and people have built things on top of that that are basically frameworks that a web developer can, can work with to make VR experiences. And that can be importing 360 video or 360 photo. You can do, you know, rendered experiences like avatars and all that. And I, I kind of became aware of it in the beginning of last year. And I've actually run a couple hackathons, which is my super geeky way of learning about technologies. I organize an event and let smart people play with it and tell me about it. So we've been, we've been kind of interested in it anyway for a while. I like it because you can prototype very quickly. It's just as fast as throwing something, you know, throwing up a, a web page. You can deploy it super easily. It is not it is not as good yet. Well, that's not true. It, it, in practice, it's not as good as you can do with Unreal or, or Unity because all of it has to be served as if it were a website. So if you want a, a really rich, deep experience, you're going to have latency problems or you're going to have to engineer your way around the fact that it has to be downloaded kind of on an ongoing live way, as opposed to a a Unity or Unreal experience where you let it download and then you play it. It is not a gaming engine, which Unity and Unreal are, so it doesn't come with some of the physics and some of the things built in. There is less of a, it is not as mature as an authoring tool as as Unity and Unreal are because there just isn't the same, you know, enormous gaming and gaming industry behind it kind of driving some of those, some of those tools. Having said that, it is rapidly becoming, WebVR is rapidly becoming better. They're actually launching something called WebXR, which will enable a, a augmented reality and mixed reality as of sometime this year. It, there's a lot of companies coming together to, to make sure the standard works. So, you know, it depends on what you want to do. If you want to distribute something easily, the other thing about WebVR is it works on every machine. There, you don't have to have a separate build for a, for a, a Vive or for an Oculus, which is, which is exciting because it means you can deploy it across basically anything. There is a little back-end engineering for that, but it's not, it's not prohibitive. So if you want something that is, that is relatively light, does have some interactivity, but isn't quite the same as something you might do in, in you know, Storyline, WebVR is a really good solution because it's, it's so cheap and so easy to distribute. If you have something that's more complex and has more of a, of a, of a you know, branching script, you're probably better off with, with a gaming engine because honestly, that's what a game is, is. It's the ultimate branching script. Regarding WebVR and distribution, they just released, I think it's the Mozilla group. It's called Super Medium, which is a WebVR browser that allows you to easily just open up a URL and, and check out a full VR experience that, that almost looks like. But like you said, it's not totally like Unity or Unreal, but that's a great app for being able just to distribute your content without having to get into these stores and, and go through that whole process. I don't know if you've played with that or not. Not yet. I actually know the guys that, that they, they, they left. They were running the, the web VR. Specifically, there's a framework called A-Frame. So these two, they were ro- absolute rock stars, and I'm, I'm hoping to get them to, to speak in New York. Kevin No is, is the, the main one that I know. You don't need super medium to view web VR at all. Any, any browser will work. There's some workarounds, but it works right now on on Safari, on, on, you know, Chrome and Firefox, obviously Firefox. But, but what they've done is really cool and it's, it's just launched. You're right. I'm really excited for them because I think it's going to make web VR just easier and more accessible. So yeah, it, it's, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to what, what they've, what they're going to do. So what's the typical cost of a VR simulation on the average compared to a standard, you know, simulation? So this is one of those questions where it depends is, is in, in, inescapable. 
you know, you can you can build a, a prototype for you know, we 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 are able to do 360 things for the cost of produ- producing a, a little 360 video, which is very very inexpensive. You know, you can do that for a couple grand. All the way up to big rendered simulations can be in the you know tens to hundreds of thousands. I had a, a meetup the other day where that's VR learning in New York, and someone mentioned one of the big consultancies will charge up to two million dollars. Now that's part of a huge engagement and all that. I, I don't think anyone should be thinking you know that much, but it is. It's like video. You can get video done for very cheap. You know, all the way up to a TV ad that can cost you know six million, whatever it is. So I, I think that there, people should be thinking about people that have created content and on their on the you know in their careers should be thinking of video as an analogy. The, the specifics are different, of course, but you are are going through this. You should be going through the same process that you go through with video in that you brief somebody and they create a storyboard and the storyboard helps you think through what's you know what's going to connect to what and how it's going to happen then they create a prototype for you which is essentially a rough cut and then they refine it over you know a series of refinements so i think it depends on what someone wants to do if they want to shoot 360 and and add some interactivity to it, it it often is kind of inexpensive and in fact there are existing software offerings where you can slot in your your 360 video and they already have a lot of the interactivity done. So then it becomes a SaaS question. Our micro simulations are exactly that, but there's a lot of people doing the same thing. So I think it's a really big range. And unfortunately, to give people a rule of thumb, I would say think about video plus a bit. Definitely. It's definitely not a cheap thing to do today. I'm sure as technology improves, more people get into it. It will become cheaper. But then again, you know, if anything good will will cost some money, right? That's right. And and it depends on what service you're asking for. If you just want a couple game developers to make you something, you, you're going to wind up with, with less than you want. I mean, you're, you're part of what you're paying a, a production company to do. And, and presumably, whether it's a consultant or other people that are engaged with you, helping you think through how am I delivering the best possible learning? So it isn't just how do I produce VR? It's thinking through and prototyping maybe more than you otherwise might to make sure that you're giving people an, an experience that's better than just video in 3D that I'm, you know what I mean? Like, I, I think that, that a, lot of, a lot of people that are thinking about this now are going to have a bit of a learning curve to apply their existing intuition to VR. You know, they already understand how learning works or, if, or they wouldn't be in, in the e-learning world. How are they applying this to the new medium? And, and I think that takes a little bit. It takes a little time. And sometimes you're doing that with a vendor and sometimes you're doing that because you've gone to a, a, an arcade and just spent some time playing with it. Right. And and right now, I think everybody wants to just do it because it's super cool. And like you said, they've been to an arcade and they go, oh, my God, this is amazing. Let's do something in e-learning and VR or anything in VR. But I think it's going to come to a point where the big question is going to be why VR, right? It's not just doing it in VR, but why VR? Because there are some things that don't make sense in VR. Yep. Totally agree. Let's talk about AR and the future of that. I know you guys aren't doing AR yet. You mentioned at the beginning that you're looking at that. But what's your take on AR and e-learning? What's the future involved? I think that augmented reality, mixed reality are, will probably collapse into one or the other. I, 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 I guess we'll call it mixed reality. But right now, for soft skills, I'm not sure that having a phone superimpose things over what's behind the phone is a great way to to teach people. So that's why we don't view it as a as a, a great way to teach right now. Um, I just it just feels kind of artificial and I just don't know that I'll see people doing that a lot. Mind you, I say that and someone creative is going to come up with a great idea that proves me wrong. But in general right now I feel like AR is not the user experience isn't fluid and isn't natural for e-learning. I just I'm not seeing it yet. In physical skills, things like assembly and, and repair and some other things, there are some pretty good glasses out there that are not, they're not a full rich experience yet, but they, they add information in an important way. And I think in some cases, AR is going to really blend performance support and training. So you're helping someone do their job, but you're also teaching them along the way. I do see that. It isn't something we've done a lot of. There are actually companies that have spent years getting good at using, you know, whether it's Epson or ODG or even the, the Google Glass has sort of come back as a way of, of, of helping people do their jobs and, and training them while they're doing it as opposed to separately. And I think that's the, the, the promise of AR is you can, you can be in and, and MR. You can be in the real context 
and be reminded of things or training things while you're doing the job. So I think AR, MR blends performance support and, and training in a really important way. I'm with you on that. That I'm, I'm still not getting it fully AR. I haven't gotten into it. There's a couple of apps I've tried, which I thought were great. I consider the apps that I tried that were quote unquote AR more MR versus, you know, it was a mixture of the reality you know, mixed in with the virtual, fully virtual as opposed to, you know, um, augmented or, or information on top of my, my reality here. So I'm still not getting it there, but obviously there's a lot of people that do, and I'm sure it's going to be super huge. So you said you're looking at AR possibly. Are you looking at AR Kit, which is from Apple, or AR Core, which is from Google, or both? Or So I think that you, if you're going to deploy something with a with a company, you're going to probably have to do both. You know, there, there, there are going to be differences between them. They both are deploying the same kind of machine vision, this, this SLAM, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, the simultaneous location and mapping. That's what allows you to place things on a flat surface. And apparently the new AR kit is going to allow you to do that on, on a wall too, which the, which the current version of it can't. The reason that matters is, is ultimately you're, you're going to need to find a way to develop for both, I think. We are probably, to be honest, we're more likely to use web AR than I am either of those two for the simple reason that I, I don't, I don't want to have to become a mobile development house. <laughs> and if you're, if you're developing natively for the two of them, you're, you're going to have a lot of, of development overhead. When you do things with AR or you do things with a JavaScript, forgive me for getting technical, but when you do things with, AR, with, uh, with web AR or with a JavaScript framework, you, you give yourself the ability to run on any device and not have to test it against a bunch of different Android devices and worry about the versions of, of iOS and all that. So I, I think that, that uh, they're both, it's great that they did it. It's great that Apple came out with ARKit, what is it, four years after they bought Mateo. And that's great that that spurred Android and Google to, to move away from Tango and to really come out with their own AR core, which I thought was, it was amazing how quickly they did. I don't know that one is better than the other because people have the phone they have. So you kind of need to build for both. Right, right. And it was a trick question because that's kind of like asking, should I make a iPhone app or an Android app? And obviously the answer is yes. Yeah, exactly. But it's worth exploring. It's worth discussing. Right, right. Definitely. So give me some examples that you feel are really good in e-learning that you've experienced, whether you guys created them or other people have created them. But do you have any examples that come to mind that go, this is this is why VR is great for e-learning. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I will say the micro simulations do something that's really, I think, powerful in that it makes, it allows learners to re-experience in a, in a first-person visceral way on an ongoing basis, not just once, but, but uh, you know, on their couch, on, uh, you know, on the way to work, what, what they were taught in terms of soft skills. So that, I, I obviously am a bit biased, but I'm a fan of that. The, a, a company I know called uh, Endeavor VR out of out of the West Coast did a simulation with Raymond, and it was forklifts. And I just love the fact that they they made it so natural and they made it so easy to to step into and and train. I like I like the way that worked. I haven't seen it myself, but I like this idea. The guys at ITI did something really cool. They actually incorporated the controls from a real crane. And, you know, that gets at something that, that, as a quick aside, as we get better and better at, at giving people skills and, and, and teaching them in VR, haptics are going to wind up being something that we need to really think about. I had a conversation with, with a, a gentleman who's been doing VR training for dentists for a number of years, and the haptic experience is absolutely critical for them to really train somebody on the skill. So I think that, that that speaks to a broader issue, and that is the more we're doing VR and the longer people get past their pilots and really start assessing and implementing, we're going to start to find that the, the success factors beyond just doing a good job in VR are going to probably be a little bit specific to the training, but also are going to be, be, just be something for us to continue to develop. A last one that I really liked was DHL in the UK had they had a problem in that people were packing their tra their planes. So obviously DHL has a lot of packages. They need to go on planes, and you can you can pack that plane in an efficient way or an inefficient way. And not surprisingly, untrained people were doing it in an inefficient way. So what they did was create a, a simulation that was one of the planes, and they just had people in a vibe going there and picking up boxes and, and thinking about how they would stack them. 
And it's a tremendous example of what VR is good at because no one wants to ground a $50 million plane for any length of time. So being able to train people in this was was prohibitive anyway other than VR or you they could have possibly created you know a fake plane which would have itself been expensive. So VR was able to give people a training experience that was vital to the profitability of the company, relatively easy to to execute and deploy and really made a difference. Yeah, those those are real great examples. I don't know if you're familiar with a company called I think it's called Pixel Group or something like that, but they created like this gas how to fix a, a gas meter. And obviously you can see how dangerous that could be, right? If you do something wrong, the whole thing explodes. And I just saw some screenshots of it and it looked pretty amazing that you can actually go and fix it and then, you know, die there and then reset and do it again. And I guess some people were saying that after doing that kind of experience, they could actually go into a gas meter and, and really know what they're doing. So that was another interesting one that I personally saw that I thought that was pretty cool. But you mentioned haptics. And that's obviously, we didn't even touch upon that. And we're going to touch upon it a little bit because we're almost out of time here. But haptic is obviously going to be very big, right? Not just hand gloves, but whole body suits, right, in the future. What, how do you see that? I don't think that, that whole body suits are going to be a big deal, uh, except unless it's necessary. I think that people don't want to get inside of that stuff too much, um, again, unless there's some particular reason. I think haptics are going to wind up being quite specific to what you're doing. There'll be some general ones on your hands, and there may be some general one somewhere else, like like the void has a chest plate where you can feel like you've been shot or whatever it is. But I, I you know, in talking to this this gentleman about the dentistry training, it really gets at the fact that there is specific information inside of that haptic feedback. What a tooth feels like, what a, you know, some of the other things that go on. Um, that's that's not just the the machine's ability to represent it. It's knowing how to represent it. So I think haptics wind up getting a little bit more task specific than than VR does. So we'll probably wind up with something that'll be you know, you know whether it's something like a glove or whether it's a, a controller that really works with our fingers that will have some haptics to it. Beyond that, I don't know that I see a general purpose haptic solution coming quickly. In time, I would imagine, to be honest that things like what, what Elon Musk is talking about with, with this neural lace is probably how you would replicate that, that sort of all-body experience. If you look at, just as a quick final point, if you've ever seen what the, the density of nerves looks like across the body, it's obviously very uneven. The face is, has a lot of uh, high density. The hands and, and fingers have really high density. But as you get into places like our back and our thighs and you know other places, it, it's, it gets really light. So that having a haptic experience there, it's not that it's not useful. It's just not a huge source of information for our bodies. So I think that you, you want to be careful about covering everything instead of you know, using other means to trick the mind into thinking that something's happening. So you know, we, we, there's a hierarchy of senses and the, the, the sight at the top, and I think hearing is number two, and then nose, nasal and proprioceptive. I, I think that as we, we think about what sense overrides another one, you can get an awful lot done without having to cover every, every nerve everywhere. Right. I completely agree with you. And we could actually talk for another hour on this, but unfortunately, <laughs> we're pretty much out of time. I do want to close this interview with you with a question that I ask every guest is, what is VR going to look like in 2025? Obviously, this is your opinion, and we'd love to hear what your thoughts are. I think, I think VR per se will wind up being like Netflix is right now in that the only time people are going to be in full VR really ever, I mean, now and, and ever, I think ever, is going to be the equivalent of binging, binge watching uh, you know, ne- something on Netflix. It's a particular behavior that's a subset of a broader set of behaviors. I think that, that XR is going to be ever present. It's, we're going to wonder how we ever lived without having information interacting with us in the environment all the time. I think that most of the time we'll be in, in, a, in a mixed reality environment. And there will be moments when we want to shut everything out, and the same headset will allow us to shut everything out and have a VR experience. So I do think the two are going to blend, and, and it'll be how you, want to, how, you, how you want to react with the rest of the world will be the, 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 the distinction between VR and, and AR. And as I say, I think mixed reality and augmented reality will blend together because ultimately it's the same machine vision doing it. I, I think that the distinction between them is just a, a hangover from, from really early days. Yep, definitely. Well, Hugh, unfortunately, we're completely out of time. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. Your full wealth of information you shared with us. So we really appreciate that. Thank you.
I enjoyed it. And if people want to get a hold of you or learn more about you, you want to give a URL or email address? That's great. So my name, Hugh, H-U-G-H, at Aquinas.io. So it's A-Q-U-I-N-A-S dot I-O. Anytime. We've just published that ebook I mentioned, so it's for free. And if anyone's interested in it, email me. Name it again, and I'm going to put a link to it on the show notes because I actually downloaded it, and that's what triggered me to want to talk to you because it's an it's a great ebook. There are no strings attached, which I love what you did. You didn't force people to. I don't think even forcing people to give an email address, which normally they do. On our website, we you, you do so AquinasVR.com. It's a very small price to pay for such a great guide, and I really mean that. Great stuff. Well, thank you. Yeah, if you go to AquinasVR.com, it's just a it's just a landing page with a couple details, and you can download it. Yeah, we, we talked to a lot of people who really wanted it to be a, a broad cross-section. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Hugh, and to the rest of you, I'm glad you were here with me. If you want to experience, learn, and build VR, please visit HowToCreateVR.com. We offer on-site experiences for enterprise companies, online tutorials, podcast episodes, blog articles, and more. So until the next episode, I'm your host, Marcelo Lewin. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>